Photography Daily. Today, Australian photojournalist Cameron Neville talks about why photography means so much to him. It's just something I wake up and think about every day. Um, whether I push a shutter every day or not, it's another thing. And I try to convey that in my work as much as possible, that it, it is emotional to me. It's always been an emotional connection. It was something that helped me through the disaster of my parents breaking up when I was about uh, 13 or 14. Cam Neville has been featured internationally for his work as a firefighter and photographer, making pictures of the wild, savage, brutal fires that ripped through the Australian bush and of late, whole communities. I went to this burn and, uh, you know, I'm wandering up through the forest and, um, you know, I'm hearing trees come down, but I'm finding myself walking into these areas that I know are dangerous, you know, and, uh, and things have happened to people recently where trucks have been crushed by trees and... You know, and I'm thinking, you're crazy. Like, wh- what are you doing here? Like, you know, yeah. this is this is the picture worth it? And we learn about how these fires are changing course. People just couldn't understand why the rain, why is the rainforest burning? You know, no one could get their head around it. The firefighter, the photographer, Cameron Neville today. Stories of life told by the photographers. Today's show, as all have been this month, is kindly supported by MPB, trading thousands of cameras and lenses every week across Europe and the US. MPB.com, they check and they grade and they photograph every single item. And they add a six-month warranty so you can be sure of what's in the box. And if you are buying, imagine what a relief that is, knowing that what you've saved for and invested in isn't just being sent to you on a wing and a prayer. You're able to say, wait a minute, hold on, this isn't right and be protected by that six-month warranty. This Saturday, for our members, it's the last Saturday in the month, Megasode. Just a quick heads up on what's on the show, it being Halloween, I wanted to share a story, true story, I encountered. Well, a situation, really, more that led to me, well, taking on a studio, then just as quickly letting go of a studio. I am not one who believes in bumps in the night. I have a wild imagination, granted. I think all creatives do. And as you'll hear in tomorrow's semi-spooked photo walk, due to location really, it can sometimes play a little with my mind, but nothing quite prepared me for the physical reaction I had to my own haunted studio experience, which I'll share with members on Saturday's Megasode. I have no idea why I needed to get so close to the microphone, but I'm genuinely quite excited to tell you that story. So, I'm going to jump straight into today's photo story. I've known Cameron Neville for a few years now, and actually there's already been a special with him, episode four, simply called Cam Neville Fighting Fires. In that edition, he talked about his work as a member of the volunteer force fighting bushfires, without which the so-called regular fire service would simply not be able to cope. 150,000 volunteers. And that number's fallen, actually. But that's what it takes to maintain a service that does battle with fires that are becoming harder to contain each year. I've known you for a couple of years now, Cam, and I know from the special I did on the firefighting and photography together is is, is both challenging, dangerous, and at times soul-destroying because you're about to go into another bad fire season, one, one which I, I think everyone is expecting, aren't they, really? The weather patterns you now have... But explain to us why Australia, why you believe it, it, it has these extremes now, because we go from fire to flood in, in literally a week. Yeah, that's right. And, and that's, um, that's kind of what happened back in, uh, I think it was January or February. It's hard to remember. Well, it must have been February. I'd, um, I'd just been to uh, the Namaji National Park in Canberra for uh, five days, uh, helping trying to fight the fire that eventually crossed the border into New South Wales and, um, you know, the half-destroyed Jindabyne uh, across the border. Um, we were chasing that fire up into the Canberra Hills for days and, you know, we, we came back weary at the tail end of our own season, um, you know, which had gone on for well past the three months you know we were up to almost sort of six and a half to seven months and uh yeah i think we got back in about um a week or two later we we had a massive flood and uh yeah overnight literally it uh, you know it, it rained and uh, dumped about um, i think it was close to six or seven hundred millimeters of rain um you know in less than 24 hours which was completely crazy yeah. and, and then you know since then it's been dry again so um you know it was like a, a one-off uh, weather weather front but we literally went from 
you know, responding to fires to um, pumping out the basements. I mean, we we went out uh, after the storm. Um, we normally don't go into sort of residential areas, but due, after extreme storms like that, we are often called upon to pump out basements and things along those lines. And um, we were down uh, closer to the coast and uh, we were pumping out. Uh, they, I'm sure they have them in the UK where they have those uh, apartments on top and you've got like a... a garage sort of underneath yeah, yeah, yeah. the building yeah. that goes down under the row when we got to this this guy's place all we saw was his ferrari floating around at the top of his garage oh, and um, yeah it was pretty crazy yeah. crazy stuff and uh so we spent four or five hours there pumping pumping water out of his basement um and you know a week earlier we we'd been fighting fires um you know uh, in the act let's rewind a little bit we'll start at the beginning for those joining your story fresh um yeah. you're uh, you, the firefighting i know is is a big part of your life um but you're a photographer based yes. where in southeast queensland yeah, I live in um, a beautiful little place called Guanabar, which is um, at the base of Mount Tambourine. Um, it's about 35 kilometres inland from the Gold Coast, which is probably more well known yeah. um, than where I live. Um, but yeah, it's a smallish community um, of about 1,400 homes, and uh, we're nestled into the base of the hills here. So Yeah, beautiful part of the world. But, but what were you doing photographically? What is your background photographically? Well, that's a long story. Yeah. <laughs> I, know, I know it's changed quite a lot of late, but let's let's go back to when you were sort of more gainfully employed in that in that uh, in that media. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when I had a job. Yeah. That's it. Um, yeah, look, I, I mean, I, I lived and worked in Sydney from about uh, 1997 through to about uh, 2010. Um, and over that period of time, I worked, I had a, a photography, a commercial business based in Surrey Hills in, in Sydney. Uh, I was doing a lot of copy photography and making large prints and things along those lines. Um, yeah. Uh, but I'd, I'd always had this, you know, this urge to get back to shooting documentary work, which is what I'd done during my time at university in England. So, um, you know, and I, I eventually published that work at a small book um, after moving here. Um, yeah, and then uh, we moved here in 2010. We bought this farm and we've sort of been doing it up. My business kind of just stopped um, because I was out of Sydney, but I knew that would happen. Hmm. Um you know, I, I think there were sacrifices just to be made because I um, I couldn't sustain kind of what I was doing down in Sydney. It was, you know, it was almost seven days a week. I, I had clients calling me on 9 p.m. on a Sunday evening, you know, demanding demanding work for the Monday morning. And, you know, I just thought I'd, I just don't want to live like this. And then, at, you know, at one stage I was eating in a cafe across the road from work and, you know, I get a video call from my wife. The kids are going to bed, and you know, I've missed another family meal, and yeah. you know, and I'm I'm just thinking. And it was, you know, and at that point, I think I felt really quite lonely. Mm. You know, I was missing this incredible time in their life, and and so that's that's when I said, look, we're gonna we need to pack up and move. Um, and then yeah, moving here, and uh, I just had to change and yeah. adapt, as I've done with things in most of my, you know, most of the things I've done, I've never. Uh, you know, particularly photographically, yeah. I think I, I haven't overly uh, considered how it's going to affect my earning potential. So, um, but I think, you know, as you and I have discussed over the years that, you know, photography it runs much deeper in me than yeah. uh, financially, um, than, you know, certainly chasing money. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it's just something I wake up and think about every day. Um, whether I push a shutter every day or not is another thing. And I try to convey that in my work as much as possible, that it, it is emotional to me. It's always been an emotional connection. It was something that helped me through the disaster of my parents breaking up when I was about uh, 13 or 14. Well, you can't take the photographer out the boy, can you? Because when you, when you move to, uh, to where you are now, um, you became, well, you, you joined the volunteer firefighting force. And I, I, I don't think people quite understand just how large that force is in Australia. And it has to be large because, of course, 
as the as the fire season has shown, you need a lot of bodies on the ground to to fight those fires, don't you? Yeah, you do. And um, you know, in Queensland alone, I think there's uh, something around uh, thirty three thousand volunteers. Oh, amazing. Yeah, and it, it's quite an incredible force to mobilise. You know, we, as we've discussed in the past, you know, the during disasters and things like that. You know, people just put their hands up as soon as there's been a cyclone or a fire or something's happened. You know, but, you know, everyone's out the door mm, mm. Um, because they want to help. And I, I think that's a. It just gives me great hope and positivity for the future that people are still willing to just give up their time to go and help others. And for me, it's like a basic. A human function is mm. to help people you know opening a door picking something up for someone that's dropped it that's got their arms full of things you know it's it, it's something that you think about later and think yeah you know i actually did something worthwhile today but the yeah the force is and i mean i think in total in, in australia there's somewhere around three hundred thousand volunteer yeah, I know. firefighters I know. and that's not just um <laughs> you know front frontline firefighters you're talking about incident management um, personnel, you're talking about logistics. Um, there's all sorts of people involved in, in rural fire services. And let's not forget, you know, the wonderful SES, um, which we have here as well, which is the state emergency services. And they handle a lot of searching and they do rescues. So if you go walking out in the bush here and you're lost, they'll, they'll come out and look for you. And mm. um, it's an amazing country for volunteers and in in other parts of the world it'd be very difficult to get into these situations and you know i feel very fortunate to have had those you know experiences that i've had through being able to access and do the training and, and get on get on board with them so well as, as i said you can't take the photographer out the boy and and as, as you've started fighting these fires back came these thoughts of oh i know cam i can be a i, I can i can do some documentary work here you are and you you became a firefighter and for photographer all in one and i know that fighting the fires comes first and the photography comes second whilst you're out there doing it but that's what you've been doing and whilst other photographers will show up for newspapers photograph these events then disappear back to their cities to put the stories together you go out there day after day after day with your camera it's been an organic process of I don't think I really had a great idea about what I was doing at the time. You know, it, it, I just knew it was something uh, valid that would be very interesting if I could get to the front lines. But to be honest, you know, I had no idea where the journey was going and it, you know, it terrified me, I think, that first fire I saw and I, I honestly thought, what are you doing here? But over time that seems to have dissipated and I think, I, you know, it's been almost a decade now I've been shooting that project. It's a never-ending project as well, really, isn't it? Well, I think so. I mean... Look, they talk about viewer fatigue as well. So I, I don't know. I, I, I've been going through, a, you know, sort of more dark period in, in my, uh, shall we talk about my mental state over the last sort of six to eight months, yeah. uh, thinking a lot about that. And, and, you know, it's validity. You know, I'm not sure how valid it is and what it's, con you know, what am I con contributing towards photojournalism or documentary photography you know other than making these startling pictures but after a time i'm wondering if it's you know like a flicker book where every, you know everything's just going to look the same um but to me you see you know it's funny <laughs> i was in my house the other day thinking about this interview and then i was thinking about the last time we talked and i remember you asked me a question about you know am, am i risk averse um, you know, because we talked about Don That's McCullen right. and yeah, how, yeah. you know, he never, you know, he didn't really think about what he was doing until afterwards. And, you know, I was recently shooting a hazard reduction burn and I remember hearing trees coming down and I was walking around. They, you know, I've got to the point with this project now where they're inviting me to go and shoot, which is an amazing situation to be mm -hmm. in, you know, and I, I went to this burn and, uh, you know, I'm wandering up through the forest and, um, you know, I'm hearing trees come down, but I'm finding myself walking into these areas that I know are dangerous, you know, and, and things have happened to people recently where trucks have been crushed by trees and, you know, and I'm thinking, you're crazy. Like, wh what are you doing here? Like, you know, yeah, yeah. this is this is the picture worth it? And then, you know, you come home and uh, from that particular burn, I think you've seen the photo. I, I got a photo, another amazing photo of a firefighter walking through with his drip torch and it just made everything worthwhile. But 
I don't know if you'd be saying that if you ended up in hospital. No. <laughs> you know, it's like well, you did send me a you did send me a message. I hope you don't mind me quoting a private message you sent me this weekend. I was back shooting an HR burn. I think it's the one you're talking about. Actually, it felt good. Um, that that was the intriguing bit, and it felt good. Although I am starting to feel my nerves are going from the constant exposure to danger. Yeah, that's uh, and that's certainly you know been a dark path. I think over the last sort of eight or nine months is uh, I, I think uh, you know I've, I've felt that. I think after Black Summer last year and that that exposure we had day after day after day to fires and more fires and just being permanently have adrenaline running through you was, um, you know, starting to, my mind was starting to sort of fray a little bit in areas. And I, I think that's inevitable, I think, with you have exposure to those kind of situations, but you, you have to try and understand, A, why you're there and B, what you're doing. And, and if that becomes, if you can't answer that question, then I, I think it's time to stop. It seems to me that the, the, it's changed a little bit. The, the, if you uh, pardon the use of the word, the focus of, of, of it has changed slightly. And in that, when we spoke last time, you were definitely for, you were definitely firefighter first, photographer second. Although now you're saying that they're inviting you to go shoot, which I don't think they were doing last year. Um, so is it is it swa- no. is it swapping a bit? Are you becoming? if you like, the photographic wing of, of the, the fire service now? Well, you know, it's in, there's been interesting developments and, you know, because we, we talked a lot about, you know, I, I felt the project is very strong. I think the images are very strong and it's certainly, you know, been received um, in that manner by a lot of people. Um, but I, I think now, when, oh, you know, they say, oh, there's that guy, the guy that shoots all the fire photographs. So, yeah, it has. You know, a lot of things have changed, and I, I think the focus shifted. And it's interesting that you ask that, and it's very perceptive of you because, as you know, I, I tend to mull things over quite a bit. You know, do, doing my everyday things, driving in the car, going to the supermarket. I'm constantly processing these things, and I, I think it definitely has shifted. Um, I had some contact with the Queensland Fire and Emergency uh, Media Department, who uh, have been using my images since. Uh, since the Canungra fire last year you know and I, I don't mind you know i get access to things and therefore i i feel it's a fair fair trade to be able to go and and do these things and so i've been invited to a few things now to specifically to shoot and so there has been some shift in focus whether they uh, you know there was a bit of resistance to this at the beginning i feel from them but i think because you know i've been at it for so long you know everybody in the service knows me now it takes a lot of pressure off me as well because you know i do feel that when you know you you go in the truck that's that's what you're doing you're yeah. a firefighter yeah. whereas now because the focus has shifted a little bit i have been allowed to turn up and and um, photograph and just function on that level. And therefore, I, you know, the reason has a reduction burn. I mean, I, I normally go out with the mindset of getting one really good image. And I, I came back with about half a dozen, which was a really good day. I know. Yeah. So. Last year, the fire that shook everyone was the, uh, the Sarabar complex fire. And that's Black Summer, isn't it? It started the end of August, wasn't officially extinguished till Christmas Eve. Uh, that's the best part f- of four grueling months. How, how did it grab hold that badly that the most proficient of forces in the world had such a battle? Well, we were we were in unprecedented conditions um, at, at that stage. Um, I recently uh, watched uh, an interview with Mike Wassing, who's the uh, deputy commissioner, and he was talking about the fact that we we had best practices in place, and we were, you know, we were trying to suppress the fire and. The conditions just didn't allow for it. Uh, that particular fire had got into um, rainforest area, and talking to people that know about, you know, Australian ancient rainforests, you know, they don't burn. They just don't burn. It's there's yeah. too much moisture. Yeah. You know, that kind of vegetation is doesn't burn, and it burnt, and it burnt ferociously. I remember going in a, an Australian rainforest when I visited, and I can't imagine um, with all the moisture that you're talking about how it could. Yeah, I mean, it, and you know that was the thing. It was people just couldn't understand why the rain. Why is the rainforest burning? You know, no one could get their head around it. And the other thing was that the fire split on two fronts and was burning in two different directions and and kept changing direction based on the wind patterns. 
I mean, we just had a period of weather that was allowing for this incredibly sort of ferocious fire behaviour. Um, and normally with, with fires like that, you know, a lot of time is spent on mapping the fire and, uh, you know, that'll be via helicopter and they'll map the fire front and where it's going. And from that, normally they can work out a plan to what's called pinch it out. So they'll force it into a gully, they'll force it into somewhere where it can't burn anymore. Um, but it just wasn't possible. You mentioned to me um, in, a, in a message as well that there's a feature film being made about Black Summer. Are, are, are you going to be involved in that? Uh, look, I was involved um, some time ago um, in initial talks, but nothing's actually happened since right, okay. then, so I don't know. I suspect that somewhere down the track somebody's going to make a documentary about it, um, as they did with the Black Saturday fires back in 2009. Um, there was a documentary on that. It's on YouTube if people want to check it out. It's fairly humbling watching those things to realise the enormity of what's happening. And it, it's not just happening in one place. It's, you know, it's happening all over the place. I remember from last summer the pictures of folks literally escaping to the water's edge to escape the fires as they... As they burn towards them, I mean that was what was the what's the reaction of the Australian people being like to the climate and the fires? I mean, you're, you're a resilient bunch, you Australians. Yeah, we are, but I think you know it really shook everybody, and particularly the amount of animals that suffered. You know, um, we are animal lovers here, and people didn't want to see our native wildlife burn. I mean, watching. You know, I can hardly talk about it now, but watching pictures of koalas, you know, with steam coming off them from the heat of the fires coming out of the bush was, it's just, no. it's absolutely horrific. You know, I can look at a house burning down and think, yeah, well, that can be rebuilt. It's bricks and mortar. No one was in there. No one's dead. You know, but when you're watching wildlife suffering and, and, and right, and, and I mean, you know, I, I saw that firsthand when I was at a fire uh, north of uh, Brisbane um, last year. You know, we found a baby koala in, in, in the bush, you know, in the burnout area. Um, luckily, it was okay, um, but we don't know what happened to the mother. Uh, and, you know, you're just hearing these cries coming from the animals. It's, uh, But, yeah, look, I, I think um, we are resilient, um, but that really did shake people. I mean, there's images, as you've seen, of, of people being evacuated off the beaches onto boats. There's uh, There was incredibly heroic things. I mean, there's videos on YouTube. You can see, you know, people protecting their homes as the fire comes racing up the hill. For a lot of people around the world, it's, you know, it's such a foreign notion to have to go out with a hose. I mean, it's like you standing outside your house and having to protect it with a hose and yeah. a rake and watching this fire come down your street and burn every house down in your street. But it is part of our landscape and it's something you know, we need to talk about and we do need to talk about how the climate's affecting these fires now. And they, fire seasons in Queensland, you know, even since I started uh, nearly 10 years ago, have changed. You know, last year's fires here were unprecedented. They hadn't seen anything like that for nearly 50 years. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's it's going to get worse. There will be a lull in this, you know, in the fire behaviour uh, for a while, but it will come back and there will be fires in places that they haven't had fires before. And it's going to keep getting worse and worse and worse. And we know that because of what's happening in California right now as well. And the thing is, you know, it's still, you know, we talk, I talked about validating my work. And I think that's the important point is those images still need to be out there. People still need to see them because we need to be reminded to take some action on you know, how we're living. My thanks to Cameron Neville, and you can see more of his work if you go to today's show page on photographydaily.show. Just look for episode 124, titled It's Crazy, It's Dangerous, But I Have to Photograph It. And Cam returns for a second part next week. Tomorrow is Photo Walk Day, of course, but Monday our guests return. And we start the week with Denise Maxwell, who met with an empty diary back in March, thanks to a worldwide pandemic, said, uh-uh, no way, and went headlong into battle with it, which she won. Hear what she did and how she did it on Monday. Yes, tomorrow's photo walk day, and with Halloween weekend tapping at our bedroom windows, look behind you, I'm going on a walk to a place called Coombe Gibbet, where people who'd met a grisly end for being highwaymen and pirates actually found that there was a hell beyond the end of their lives. Sounds horrible, doesn't it? And it is. Intrigued? Walk with me tomorrow. Thanks to mpb.com for their assistance in helping grow the show. Go to mpb.com if you'd like to find out more about buying and selling and trading used gear. 
Music in the show today from artlist.io and I look forward to photographing with you, hearing from you and talking with you tomorrow. Photography Daily is a Loading Zone production.